All right. Good night, man. I believe I heard you guys really singing on a, you know, on the on your part. <laughs> that part uh I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah a louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Sing a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Boy, if you can't get fired up about that, I believe you're just dead. I, you, know, you need to check your pulse, all I can tell you, because that is something else, man. I'm serious. That is, that is a word. That is a word from the Lord. That is a God-given, all of them are, but that, uh, you know, they're just certain songs that come along that just seem to be particularly appropriate for the time, and that just seems to be particularly appropriate for the time, for the tough times that we're in, because life can really be tough, right? It's almost redundant to say life is hard. Hmm, life is tough. Uh, life has hurts. Life hurts. <laughs> Anybody in here exempt from the hurts of life, by the way? <laughs> exempt from them? Okay. Well, I just wondered if I'm speaking to the right group because for the next six, seven weeks, eight weeks or so, I want to talk and, and share with you from the Word about, uh, about handling these hurts of life. Because the hurts of life can, can be so devastating to us that it can alter our, uh, our work for the Lord. Uh, we can become so calloused, so indifferent. Uh, we can be hurt so deeply. Uh, things can come up and, 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 and occupy our mind and our heart, and we can develop a, a, a posture of a calloused heart and a hard heart and and we can come up with these philosophies like, well, I'll never do that again, out of hurt in life. Now, God intends for us to be his messengers, his witnesses, to be helpers of, of humanity. If, you've, if you have your notes that I wrote for you, I know some of you get those. Um, one, of the, one of the notes in there uh, at the top, the first paragraph, let me just, let me just read you something here. One of the words that can be used to describe the nature and work of God is help. Helping is not just a word used to describe what God does. A helper is what God is. It's inherent to his identity. His mere presence is a help. <laughs> Have you experienced that? Oh, yeah. Wherever he is, help is there. <laughs> In Psalm 46, David said that our God is a very present help in time of need, time of trouble. It means that God is not just someone who has helped me in the past or someone that I can look forward to helping me into the future to get to heaven when I die. God is a present help right now. Whatever God is doing, whatever God is doing, it's a help to me. Or whatever God's not doing, it, it's, a help to, it's a help to me because we know that Philippians 4.28 says what? For all things work together, right, for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And so God has, has ministered to us and is ministering to us, and God has a word for us about our ministry and as God is a helper, let's, let me just read these verses to you. I want you to see, I want you to see this. I, I've, you know, I know like you, have any of you ever heard or many of you, what, how many of you have heard, I should say, uh, this phrase, shake the dust off? Oh, yeah. I mean, you've heard it, right? You know, it, well, you know that it's a command of Jesus given to his disciples when he sent them out to minister to the world, right? Yeah. And he said, if you're not received by the people that you go to, if they, won't, if they won't receive you or, or they won't hear the words that you're saying to them, uh, sh shake the dust off your feet and move on. Right. Now, I have never in my life, and you might find this hard to believe, I have never in my life preached a message on this, on, on this passage. It's just one of those passages, you know, that you just quote a lot. You know, you, you'll quote that every now and then. Just shake the dust off, brother. Yeah. But what does, that, what does that really mean? And what did, why did Jesus say something like this to us? Because, you know, Jesus sent out his disciples three different times. I'm not 
sure if you're familiar with this. It, a lot of times when you read it in the scripture, you just kind of group it all together like it's one big thing. But it's really three different occasions. When the, when the disciples, the 12 disciples that we'll read about in just a moment in Matthew 10, when the 12 disciples were, uh, you want to call, call it graduating, <laughs> in their theological residency, if you want to get real education about it, before they graduated, they had to go on an activity. And the activity that they had to go on was going to be graded by Jesus as to how well they do with what they've learned from him the last three and a half years. Well, a year later, Jesus takes 70 people, or some Bibles say 72. I don't think it really matters one way or the other. But he pairs them up two by two, and he sends them out. And he basically says the same thing to them that we're going to read here in Matthew 10 that he said to his disciples when he sent them out. The difference is the disciples are only going to go to the Jews. They're not going to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. And he says, don't go there. Just go to the house of Israel. And this is what you preach when you get there. And he gives them these instructions. Now, he's going to say very similar things to the 70 when he sends them out two by two. And then, of course, the final uh, uh, sending forth is what we call the Great Commission, which is in Matthew 28, which he gives to all of us, to everybody that is, that is a Christian. And that commission says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So that's a great commission. And of course, it's far broader and far more sweeping than, than the other two. But, but in Matthew 10, Jesus, I think, has a very specific purpose for what he says. And we're going to be looking at some hurts in life for the next uh, eight, seven, eight weeks. We're going to look at anger. We're going to look at anger. Uh, Bitterness, uh, today rejection, resentment, uh, disappointment, discouragement, all of the big ones that really can plague our life. And, and I believe God has something to say because those things are counterproductive to what God has called us to do and can create in us a, a real uh, blockage to doing what God said with the right attitude and the right heart and the right life. Especially if you've been with him for a long time. <laughs> Believe me, it can get to you after a while. And here, this is the beginning of verse 1 of Matthew 10. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, this is going to be highlighted again about seven verses from now. And, and, uh, and, and these are just, these are sicknesses. These are miracles He's going, to, he's going to empower them with the ability to do these miracles because these miracles will testify to their, to their audience. The Jews will recognize these miracles as being Messiah-type miracles because Isaiah the prophet, which they know all about, they know every word Isaiah said, they know every prophecy that all of the Old Testament gives, but especially Isaiah Isaiah probably spoke more about the Messiah than any of the other prophets all put together. And so they knew every word, and Isaiah said, man, when the Messiah comes, things are going to be different, and there are going to be miracles that happen. And so Jesus, knowing that the house of Israel will be looking for the Messiah miracles, empowers his disciples with the ability to do these miracles. And now the names of the 12 apostles are these. I just put these up. I just put this because I know somebody out there may not know the 12 apostles uh, or may not even know, you know, where was the list? I, I missed the list. Well, here, here's the list right here. These are the 12. First is Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They're called the sons of thunder, by the way. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the writer here, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and of course, last, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. 
These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. There they are. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have received and freely give. They would have recognized all those. As a matter of fact, you remember, some of you that study your Bible and and can remember these facts about John the Baptist, is that John the Baptist, of course, is the forerunner of Jesus. And he was the one born, he's his cousin, he's born six six months ahead of Jesus, basically. And he is born on this earth as a, as a voice crying in the wilderness to make straight the paths of the Lord. In other words, to prepare a way for Jesus. And John does that. And John baptizes people in the Jordan River and he eats locusts and wild honey. And he's just a rugged character. And he gets arrested. And while he's in jail, he sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus to ask Jesus, Jesus, are, are you the one that we are looking for or should we look for another? And Jesus told his disciples, you go back and tell John that the blind are, see, uh, the blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the deaf are hearing, and the poor are having the gospel preached to them. And let me give you one more beatitude. Blessed is he who shall not be offended in me. In other words, Jesus said, you go back and you tell John everything's running on schedule. And blessed is the person who doesn't get offended by the way I go about doing my business, is what he basically said to John. And so the Jews would recognize these things, and immediately it would be like a flashing neon light, the Messiah has come, Messiah. Provide neither, he gives them some more instruction, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, two coats. Don't even wear two jackets. Don't take, take two jackets with you, nor sandals, nor staff, for a worker is worthy of his food. Mm-hmm. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. Yeah, yeah. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But it, it, this is such a unique phrase, this next one. But if, if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. Just a question. I, I, I wonder, I wonder, and I don't want you to answer this out loud. I mean, I'm just asking the question like right now at the start of everything. Uh, I wonder if there's any person or people in here today that need to go back you left your peace somewhere. And you need to go back and get it. Yeah. It's just a question. All right, we're going to go on. All right. That's not the end of it, though. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. And whosoever will not receive you, which is most of us, most of what we think about when we think about shaking the dust off, We think about these people that will not receive us, the people that will not uh, welcome us and receive uh, uh, the message and so forth. But I want you to see that last little thing because it's in there. He said, now I'm talking to you not only about people who are going to receive you, but I'm talking about people you, you, you might just be talking to if they won't receive you or hear your words. Because I know you talk to people, right? And I know you sometimes you're saying, are you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I mean, I know your ear, I know the, the mechanics is, are working right, you know, and your eardrums vibrating and all that, and I know you can understand English, but, you know, are you listening to what I'm saying? So Jesus has given us some instructions now about, about people and what to do when people won't receive you. When people reject you, what, what, what do you do? Assuredly, I say to you that it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. God created us. God's a helper in life. 
God, God is a constant help in a, in a time of need. He, he's always there. He's always present. He's ever present to help us. He helps us. Uh, and, I, and I know if I gave you a, ta- a chance to testify, you would say, uh, I know God helps because I'm sane in my membrane because God has helped me, right? Otherwise, you would have been whacked out somewhere. I, 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 I'm stable and spiritual because God helped me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no weapon that my enemy formed against me prospered because God was a constant helper in my life. The book of Genesis says that you and I were created out of the dust of the ground and that God created us in his own image after his own likeness. He created them, both male and female created he them. So we were created by God to be like God. And although there are many attributes of God that are incommunicable, which is a big word you can take to your friends from the parking lot church, incommunicable, a shallow little place down there in the, in the shopping center. Incommunicable means that they don't transfer. It means God created it and we're created in his image, but certain things didn't transfer to us. They are, they are, they are for God alone. And we can, you know, we can see those things, you know, omniscience and omnipotence and ever-present. I mean, you know, you can see some of those attributes that are not given to us, but but certainly some we inherited from God some of his best qualities. And, 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 and so I believe that as humans, and maybe you can testify, that we have, been, we have been given from God that instinctive nature of being a helper, trying to help people, trying to lift people and better people and support people and and help them have a better life and a better existence and, a, and an easier life and a better pace in life. And, 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 and so, you know, God has given us that and, and it just is something born on the inside of us that is instinctive, that we want to help. Jesus says here in Matthew 10 that as we help, we are going to run into people who are going to resist our help. And no matter how softly we try or genuinely we make the effort to be of help in their life, they are just simply not going to, not going to open themselves. Yeah, they're just not going to receive it. Good word. Uh, so according to Jesus, and, and I'm just trying to build a little thought here because uh, you, you need to think this way. According to Jesus, our ability to help is not just based on our own willingness to help. Just because I'm willing to help doesn't mean that they're going to receive my help because even more likely in a greater nature, uh, they have to be open to, to, to be helped. I mean, we, we have to be willing and able, but they must be open in order for help to come. Jesus, uh, Revelation 3.20, I quote it all the time. Revelation 3.20, what does Jesus say? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I will come into him and I'll have fellowship with him and he can have fellowship with me. So it is not simply the ability and the anointing of the helper that is involved. It is the willingness uh, to open the door and let someone come in. Now, you can give people almost anything except openness. No matter how gracious, how kind, how sweet, how genuine, how attractive, or whatever you package your help You can't make somebody be open to receive it. Are you hearing me? You can't make people be open. You can't make anyone, a husband, a wife, a child, a cousin, an in-law, a boss, an employee, a fellow worker, 
You cannot make people be open. And, and rejection is a very painful experience. And it affects us all in, in lots of different ways. But when you are rejected while you are attempting to help someone, uh, a whole new attitude can be created. And this attitude, well, let's just call it uh, bitterness. I mean, when you watch loved ones, you, you have to sit on the sideline and watch loved ones suffer. When you have plenty of things you could do to help, maybe you've tried to help and the help's been rejected and now you're just having to sit there and watch them over and over go through seasons of life and for whole seasons you're sitting on the bench watching, watching them suffer and, and, and there's nothing that you can do about it and, and when you spend time like that, it's, it's just frustrating and, and tormenting in life and it and it, and it builds a bitterness inside of us if we take it personally. And so uh, Jesus has some words for us in Matthew 10 about how to handle rejection so that you don't get bitter, so that you don't take it personally. Because, see, I'm telling you, if you, take, if you let rejection become personal, they're rejecting me because they don't like me, or they think I'm stupid and I can't help, or... They don't think I know what I'm talking about. And you let, that, you let that rejection become personal, and that personal rejection is going to turn into bad stuff, but mostly bitterness and a calloused heart and an empty attitude in life. Well, I'll never do that again. So to all of us, Jesus has some words to say, and, and Jesus prepares his disciples to go out. And I know you remember everything that was just said. But the first thing he does, he does four things to them. That's, it's not in your note. You, if you're going to put these in there, you have to write them. But they're just little, they're just little points. You'll, you'll see them. The first thing that he does is he empowers them. Now, to empower somebody means to give them ability, assistance, and authority. So Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you the ability. I'm going to give you my assistance and I'm going to give you the authority because just because you have the ability doesn't mean that you have the authority to do those things. I mean, these guys are going to recognize these miracles. So Jesus is specific and says, uh, I'm going to let you heal the sick. I'm going to let you cleanse the leopard. I'm going to let you cast out demons uh, and, and raise the dead. And man, when you do, it's going to be something. And I'm giving you the authority to do that. So he says, I'm going to give you power. Next thing he gives them is a plan. I mean, if you're going to go out, you have to, you have, to have a plan, right? So he tells them where they're going. He tells them what to take with them. He tells them what not to take with them. He tells them how to approach people when you approach them. Tells them how, where they're going to stay, how they're going to survive, and what to do if people don't want them there anymore. So he gives them a plan. Then third, you got to have a, a message to preach. And he says, all right, here's your message that you preach. As you go, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Tell them that God's kingdom has arrived here on the earth. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, he's, he gives them a perspective. You remember the perspective verse in 16? Jesus said, I'm sending you out like wolves, like sheep among wolves. This is, good, this is a good practice, by the way, to let people know in advance what is going to be inevitable, and that is that you are going to encounter people that are not like you. I'm sending you out, and you are a sheep. But when you get out there, there's going to be people that are not like you. They are going to be like a wolf. And how is a wolf? Well, aggressive, uh, assertive, hostile. Uh, you're going to meet people that you have one disposition, and they have a totally opposite disposition in life. They're going to be biting on you and chewing on you while you're trying to help them. When you try to help them, they're not going to look at it as you trying to help them. They're going to look at you as trying to hurt them, spoil their fun, stop their life. 
you're going, you, you have a calling to go to them, but they're not going to look at it as a calling from God. They're going to look at it as you're trying to control their life. And so when you go out, you need to know this because uh, I want you to be prepared for, for what is out there. And I want you to be ready when people come against you. When they reject you. To come, I, I, I just love you, man. You know, I mean, be prepared. Uh, I'm in your face because... You're in my heart. You know what I mean, come oh, on, man. You know, I'm not trying to control life. I, I got a, I, Hey, I got enough control of my own. I got enough life of my own. I certainly don't need to control anybody. Else. But, but, but you're going to face these, and he gives them a perspective so they won't be surprised by the inevitable. Now, how do you react when people won't listen? I know you have power. I know you have a great plan. And I know you have a great message. I'm going to tell you what to say. And I know you're going to tell them what I just said. But, I won't, but, but, but they're still not going to listen to you. And, he, and we need to know this. Because we think many times, brother, if we have a plan and we know what we're talking about, and we have been commissioned by God, and we feel like the Lord is leading us, and the Holy Spirit is prompting us, and we have the right stuff to say, we think, man, people are going to listen to us. But Jesus said, hey, just, no, 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 just because you out there, and just because you, you have all the goods, it doesn't mean that they're going to listen to you, and Jesus could speak from personal experience, because Jesus said, they didn't even listen to me. And so we need this perspective in life, and, and he tells them this so that they hopefully won't take it personal and get bitter toward people and angry at God. How many of you, man, don't raise your hand now. <laughs> Rhetorical question. How many of you have ever been mad at God? Oh, man, come on. I mean, admit, don't, uh, don't raise your hand now. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I mean, have you had the audacity to be angry at God? Like, God, I'm doing everything I can. Where are you? I've given up everything to serve you. I've given my life up. I, I, I give my tithe. I go to church. I, I, I try to do nice things. I read the Bible. I, and, and, and what does that get me? Nothing. Nothing. Raw deal, raw deal. I gave up everything and you gave me nothing. Well, so... So the, so the Lord prepares them. And I'm saying to you that you need to have the perspective that not everybody's going to listen to you no matter how good you say it, no matter how smart you are. I mean, you can be the most professional person that has ever existed on this earth. You can have the wisest things to say. You can smell good and look good and have your hair combed and your teeth brushed and everything else. And, and they still many times aren't going to hear what you say. So he tells them, in verse 12 and 13, okay, go into somebody's, when you go into the village, uh, inquire about who in this village is worthy. So I, I'm thinking that must mean, you know, has a, has a spirit of hospitality or, you know, or people that would be welcoming to strangers. So go in and inquire who's worthy. And, and then you go stay in the house the whole time you're there of who's worthy. And you go out from there and you do your work out in the community from that central place and you come back. And, and, and when you go to a house, you need to greet them. Don't, don't just walk in and just try to cold sail somebody on something. I mean, build a little rapport. Build a little atmosphere of, uh, of, 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 of uh, sharing here. And when you go into the house, he said, greet them. And here's how you greet them. He said, you know, the Jewish had the... the had the uh, uh, saying, uh, peace, shalom, is what they say. Even now, you know, shalom. It's a, it's a pronouncement. It's a, it's a blessing, a pronouncement of blessing. And he said, but if that situation turns hostile, when you will go in there and you say, peace be to you, and it all of a sudden gets hairy and a little hostile, you see a little bit of anger building up. You see a little bit of, uh-oh, they're not receiving me like I think. You take your peace back and get out of there. I mean, you, 
You, you don't leave your peace there. I asked you when we started, does somebody need to go back to where they left their peace and get it back? What would that mean? That means, think back on your life. You say, where, what, what, do you, what, would my, what would my peace be? What, what, do you, what would that be? What would Jesus talking about? Take your peace, let your peace, let your peace return to you. Well, it's talking about a point in your life where your life begins to go downhill. Where you begin to get more hostile in life. You, you, uh, your feelings, your disposition, your nature, your, your personality begin to move away. That's where you left your peace. Because you hadn't had any peace since then. I mean, dare I say, dare I say, somebody, some people, and I don't even know who I'm talking to. I'm serious. I don't even know how many or whatever. But would I dare say, man, some of us need to go back to 2016 and get our peace. Because we left it back there. And we hadn't been the same since. Some people left their peace at, 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 a, uh, at, a, at a former uh, marriage partner's home. Some left their peace at a, at, a, at a job they got fired from back there. Some people hadn't seen their peace since their child's 13th birthday. I mean, <laughs> Jesus said, man, you got to go back and you got to get that peace. You, you know, he said, Some, here's what you need to do. You need to go, you need to get ready, you need to go back. You need to say, excuse me, excuse me. I left something here and I need to get it back. Okay, thank you very much. And you need to get your peace and get out of there. Because you have to have your peace in order to survive in life. Hey, you can have the clothes. Just give me my peace back. All right, how about that? You can keep the car. You can, you know, you can have the house. Just give me my peace back. All right? That's right. That's right. Because if I have my peace, I can get another house. If I have my peace, I can find another job. If I have my peace, I can, I can get all of that stuff back because I serve a God of restoration and redemption. And God will deal with me, but I can come clean with God and I can be forgiven of whatever's gone on life, but I can't live without my peace. And so when you sense rejection and you take it personal and you get bitter and you get angry, it's easy to leave your peace somewhere and to try to live life forward without your peace. You know, some of you, and I don't, like I said, I don't know who I'm talking to. Your only problem here right now is you don't have any peace. And you keep trying to find it somewhere. Go back to where you left it and get it. Because it'll be there waiting on you. And then verse 14, he says, now, when you go in to a place and they, they won't receive you, Get out of here. We don't want any, you know, your advice, you know, shut it up, whatever. Or they won't hear your words. Then go out to the middle of the road <laughs> and take your shoes, like your sandals off and click them together. <laughs> Knock the dust off of them as a testimony, really, but really what he's talking about. I mean, that is a testimony. And he said, it's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for them. In other words, they had a chance to listen and receive. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have a chance to hear and receive. Sodom and Gomorrah had a backslidden, uh, a backslidden uh, uh, Old Testament man by the name of Lot that came into their town, supposed to be God's man. And what did he do? Got involved in everything they did. So Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have a chance to hear what they should do and then repent and God not stop it. So he said, it's going to be better for them in the judgment than it is for those people that won't listen to what you say. So shake your dust off your feet and go back. But you know what he's really talking about for us? He's saying, don't track the dust of rejection from one village to the next village. Shake it off. There's no way to be rejected and not get to get some dust on you. I'm going to tell you that. I mean, when you get rejected, you're going to get some dirt on you. And Jesus is just saying, you just can't let it stay there. 
You're going to get bitterness on you. Everybody is. You can't help it. It's, it's going to be a natural part of the human psyche to get bitterness. But, but you can't let that bitterness stay there. You're going to get mad when you get rejected. It's going to make you angry sometimes when you get rejected and people won't listen to you. And I'm not just talking about people out in some community somewhere that you've never gone to before. I'm talking about people you even love. They won't listen to you either. A husband, a wife, a child, a worker, a co-worker, your best friend, the neighbor that lives next door. So you, you're going to get anger on you, but you, but you can't let that anger stay there. You've got you to you gotta, you gotta dust that. You've got to get it out. You've got to dust it off and, and let it go. You, yeah. Spiritual retaliation. You know, get them back. And ooh, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could do that and they wouldn't even know it was me? Why? I mean, sadly, we are at our creative best when we're thinking up ways to get even with people, right? <laughs> Jesus said you can't, you, you can't do that. You got you to you shake the dust off. Uh, uh, because the, the, the residue of rejection from one village, we're not going to watch. All right. There's all, there are always going to be people that won't receive you. I mean, no matter where you go, there are going to be people that won't listen. They won't receive. So uh, just because you go into a place and they won't receive you, don't let that knock you off course because the next place you go to may, just, may be praying for somebody like you. I mean, boy, they, this bunch back here, they had no respect for whatever the message was or whatever the help was. But man, this bunch over here been praying to God for somebody like you to come along. And don't let the, 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 the residue of rejection from back here keep you from ministering to people who are waiting to hear, on you, to hear from you. And those people over there have enough maturity to be thankful and to know that you're helping them. And so shake the dust off. Now, this thought right here that I'm going to give you, let's just say this is for uh, the disciples in the text, all right? I mean, we're not going to take this one personally, but, but this is for the disciples. It sounds like Jesus is saying to me that uh, you don't get to pick your assignment. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm sending you, and if they won't receive you, just move on to the next one because uh, you, you can't pick where you go. I mean, I'm giving you the ability, I'm giving you assistance, I'm giving you authority, and, 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 and you can get too narrow. If I let you pick, if I let you choose, you're going to get real narrow with who you go to. Yeah, you're going to probably go to those people that, uh, that, that you love a lot and you think they love you a lot, and you're not going anywhere. In other words, you, you, the oil of your life is only going to flow within your own household. So I can't, let you, I can't let you pick, it's too narrow. And the implication here is, that if you will listen to Jesus and minister to others, then Jesus will make sure those that you love get ministered to in life because the field is full always and the laborers are few. And so, and so Jesus says, uh, I want you to understand the reality of limitation, that you do have limits and that, there are, that you're only going to be able to do certain things because if you try to force someone to be open, now you have moved out of ministry and you have moved into manipulation. If you try to force somebody to be open, uh, you've left your calling and you've started being a controller. And, and the scripture has a word for somebody like that. It's the word which. I mean, even if you're trying to control for, for something good, that spirit of domination and control and, 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 and always having to have things go your way, that's what uh, 1 Samuel 15 says, for rebellion is as witchcraft and, and uh, stubbornness as, as iniquity. So in the Bible's teaching, a witch is not some old lady with the black suit on and the black hat standing at some boiling, con, uh, uh, some boiling pot of incantations you know, with a broom and a cat. In the Bible, a witch is somebody like Jezebel or like Simon the sorcerer in the New Testament who tries to control everything that is going on in every situation so that everything works like they want it to work. 
So Jesus is not, Jesus is not telling us that we're, not going to, that we're going to always have success, but we're going to have to realize that we have some limitations. And Jesus is not encouraging us to give up on people and try to stop helping people. Uh, he's just trying to get us to understand that we can't let the rejection from one people affect the degree that, uh, that we minister to someone else. So he encourages us to, to not give up on people, but to, now, I mean, follow this thought. Don't give, don't give up on them. Here's what I'm saying. Give them up. Okay, let me try that again. <laughs> I'm about to get caught in it myself. Don't give up on them. You have anybody in your life that you've wanted to give up on? I mean, you really should have given up on them, right? <laughs> How many of you know grace goes where it, 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 it should leave from? Huh? Do you know that? I mean, I mean, grace, grace should have gotten out of the car so, uh, some of the, several of those times. He should have got out. Should have. But he didn't. He stayed there. I mean, grace goes a lot of times where grace is, you know, it's dangerous for grace to be, but grace, crazy grace, you know, stays there. So like the father of the prodigal son, Jesus is saying to us that, that instead, of, instead of giving up on people and allowing the bitterness from the past to affect your ministry with people now, don't give up on them. Uh, uh, give, give them up to God. Give them up to him. Uh, that's, that's all we can do with them. Because we don't have the ability to force people and change people and the blindness that people have to open their eyes. We can't do that. We try. We can't fix them, Bill said. Yeah, that, we try. We prepare ourselves. We, we, we ask God to go with us and we, we try to... Uh, be for our timing to be right and, 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 our, and our approach to be right. But we can't make them change. And, and God's saying, look, you need, you need to be aware of this and you need to understand this because if you don't understand this, you are going to take it personally. Like, what's wrong with me? And then when you start taking it personally, it's going to start affecting your life and you're going to lose your drive and your momentum. So uh, sometimes you just have to let them go and give them up to God because if, if, I, if I try to hold on, I'm going to be in God's way. God's doing something in their life. If I try to hold on when I should let go, I'm in God's way. Have you ever tried to feed a baby that tries to help you feed them? <laughs> I'm telling you, when, when children get to a certain age, they start reaching their hands out trying to get the spoon or whatever you feed them. And it's like, and you're, you know, you're going, you're battling and they're trying to get it through, you know. And you're basically looking at them and saying, you know, if you would just relax, uh, I, I, could get, I could get you fed. Uh, and, and we can be like that. We can think that we're helping in a relationship but we're not really helping in a relationship. We're actually ruining the relationship because the, the control that we're trying to exert on them is, uh, is breeding resentment. And so we have to let it go. So Jesus says, all right, here's your attitude. Shake the dust off and walk forward and be ready to, be ready to, to have limits, be ready to face the reality. Now, I'm going to give you right now uh, about five people that you can't help. They're about, and I know you, you got them <laughs> ready. And I, I, I left you a big old long blank because it's about, it's about six or seven words that go in each one of those blanks. Okay? All right, these are people now that you need to have a perspective that you're not going to be able to help. Uh, first of all, you can't, you can't help people who think they don't need help. Before you can be saved, you've got to see yourself as lost, right? Before, before you can come to the Savior, you've got to, you've got to think, I need a Savior. I mean, in order, to in order for me to get you to take medicine, you have to believe you're sick. 
By the way, if I have to convince you to take pain medicine, you just aren't hurting enough. <laughs> I mean, if you get hurting enough, you'll take a rock if you think it'll help you. But in order for you to take me to get you to take medicine, you have to believe you're sick or wear a cast. Uh, you would have to believe that somehow you had something broken in your body and you need it. We can, do, we can do many things to people, but we can't get them to see things the way that they are. In Ephesians, the, the Apostle Paul spends about half of the first chapter talking to us about how great grace is. And then in verse 18, here's what he says. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start praying for you that your eyes would be open." Because you're not seeing things the way they really are. So, so in verse 18, he says, I'm going to pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened and that you would know what is the hope of your calling, the riches of your glory, the inheritance of the saints, the exceeding greatness of his, of his power. In other words, we encounter a person who does not realize their blindness. We must give them up to God and pray for God to heal their blindness because if they can't see it at some point, our, con our conversation with them is going to feel very much like condemnation to them. So you can't help somebody who, don't, who doesn't think they need help. Secondly, you can't help people who know they need it but don't want it. <laughs> Ever met anybody like that? In Job chapter 5, I mean, excuse me, John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, there is a pool called Bethesda, and it has five porches. And on these five porches lay all kinds of sick people. And Jesus walks up, and he encounters a man who has been laying there for 38 years. 38 years he's been laying on that porch in order to be healed. And Jesus, and he, and he comes up and Jesus asks him a question. Jesus says, uh, do you want to be made whole? And the guy said, evidently said, well, it's like Jesus. My goodness, why would you even ask me that? I've been laying here 38 years. And I want, you know, certainly I want to be made whole. But every time I try to get in the water after the angel stirred it, somebody jumps in there ahead of me. Why would Jesus ask somebody, been laying by a pool 38 years, if he really wanted him to, to heal him? Well, I think it's obvious. Jesus says, I can do it. I mean, I have the power. I have the ability. to be, I have the authority to be able to do this. But, but, but do you want me to? I mean, because let's be real for a minute. Everything that is bad doesn't always feel bad. Just because it's bad doesn't mean that, it's, that you don't like it. You say something to somebody sometime. When you're walking away, you're going, Phew, I know I shouldn't have said that, but it feels so good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if this guy gets healed, he's going to be responsible for his wholeness. Some people like to be the way they are because they don't have any responsibility. They always have an excuse. It's my problem. Do you want to be made well? You can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. They know they need it, but, but, but they don't want it. Proverbs says, where there is no vision, the people perish. That word perish means uh, throw off all restraints. It means, it, it, it means, it means uh, uh, to live recklessly. Live with an attitude of, I don't care. Where there's no vision for your life. If you're encountering someone that has no vision for their life, they are living recklessly and their attitude is, I don't care. So if you encounter somebody that doesn't care, there's nothing you can do about that except turn that over to the Lord because the Lord's the only person that can do something. Here's the third, uh -oh, here's the third, per, third one. You can't help people who know they need it but don't want it yet. I know I need to. Oh, pastor, I know I need to come to church. And I will one day. One day. Uh, I know I need to quit these old things. They're going to kill me, I know and I will one day. I know we get, need to get married. 
But, you know, we're not that serious right now. We're just kind of, you know, chilling with each other. Can you help somebody who knows they need to change, but they don't want to yet? Number four, you can't help people who don't want help from you. It doesn't mean they don't want help. They're just not going to receive it from you. <laughs> Jesus dealt with this when he went back to his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus goes back to his hometown as an adult, as, as Jesus, the Messiah. The Bible says that he does no miracles in Nazareth. Why couldn't Jesus do any miracles in Nazareth? Well, I would imagine because it was always that people were disrespecting him every time he turned around. I mean... Imagine how it is. What is, what is. what is the old proverb, familiarity breeds contempt? Is that what, what it says? And they are so familiar with Jesus that they can't even receive. In other words, they can't receive grace from Jesus because they're so familiar with Jesus. They, I mean, isn't that, isn't, that's Joseph's boy, right? Yeah, that's the carpenter kid, right? I mean, I've seen him working in the carpenter shop down there. What? He's the Messiah, really? I saw his mama in Dollar General the other day. I mean, come on, man. That's Jesus. That's the Messiah. <laughs> that's him. Yeah. So they, Jesus couldn't even help somebody that 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 the familiarity of the relationship was so was so near that they wouldn't receive from Jesus. Have you ever tried to help somebody, and for years maybe you talk to them and you counsel them? And you educated them, and you prayed with them, and you cried with them, and you laughed with them, and you told them things that were awesome, that if they'd have just listened, it would have really fixed them, or helped them, or cured them, or healed them, or whatever it might be. But they didn't hear a single word. And lo and behold, they will drag up here in a few months later and tell you, you know what? I just heard one of the greatest words that I ever heard in my life. It's just a wonderful new revelation for my life. And they tell you what they heard as if it's news to you. And you've been telling them for four years the same thing, but all of a sudden now somebody else tells you. You said it better than they did. But all of a sudden now, because somebody else, you, 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 know, you, you, you can't take that personally. What did I do wrong? You did nothing wrong. What did Jesus do wrong? Jesus didn't do anything wrong. But in Nazareth, they wouldn't receive him because they were too familiar with him. And then here's the last one. You can't help people who aren't willing to do what it takes to get it. Everybody wants something free, right? Something doesn't cost you anything. There was a time when the disciples were, of Jesus were in a dilemma. The dilemma was they owed tax money, but they didn't have any money to pay their taxes. Does that surprise you? Yeah, the IRS is everywhere. Yeah, they had to pay Roman taxes as citizens. They didn't have any money. So Peter comes to Jesus, and Peter says, uh, 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 Rabbi, um, we need some money to pay taxes, and we don't have any. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, well... Sounds like, you got a, uh, sounds like you got a provision problem on your hands. And so when you have a provision problem on your hands, what you need to do is you need to use your gift to, to provide the provision for you. Uh, what, can, what is it you do best? What is it you like? What? He said, well, I love fishing. He said, well, all right, use fishing. Go out there and catch some fish, and, uh, and the Lord will provide your need for the provision. And Peter goes out there, and he casts his line in, and the first fish he catches has a coin in his mouth to pay their taxes. Now, sometimes people want coins, but they want you to do the fishing. And when that happens, when you go out there and you get the coins and they lay up on the couch and you out there doing the fishing, you are not helping them. You are enabling them. And you have now become part of the problem yourself. Anybody that doesn't want to do what it takes...
to get the situation solved, then you have to give that person up to God because only God can do something with that kind of attitude. The only thing you're going to do is get taken advantage of time after time after time, and you're going to be in God's way. I, I used to I say it like this sometimes when I'm preaching on the spiritual gifts, and you're the gift of mercy out of Romans 7. Uh, by the way, that story that I just told, I know if some of you don't believe that, uh, Matthew 17, read it. It's right there. Anyway, about the fish and the coin. If, you're, if, if, if here's somebody God's working on right here, and here's God back here, and God, God's working on them, he's got them, oh, man, he's got them right where he wants them. They won't listen to him. So he's got, to begin, he's got to begin arranging some circumstances in their life to bring them to the end of themselves so that they, they, they will hear, like the prodigal son. The prodigal son, the Bible says, and no man gave him anything. And the next verse says, and he came to himself. Imagine that. When they quit giving him stuff and taking care of him and financing his rebellion against his daddy, he came to himself. And God has us many times where we have to come to ourselves, right? Well, here you come bopping in with the spiritual gift of mercy. Oh, my goodness, it poor baby. Oh, all right, now, now you are between him or her and God. Now, guess what happens when God, when God said, God's got him right where he wants him, and you now have jumped right in the way and you're going to set back everything God's been doing for six months in his life. And guess, where, guess who's fixing to get the hammer? You. Because you ride in the way where God is. Now, it, it, it's almost impossible to feel like, you know, to not get, to not get um, uh, caught up in this enablement stuff. Because anybody that cares is going to struggle with this. I mean, if you don't have the ability to help somebody then you don't have any trouble enabling them because you can't help them anyway. But if you have the money, you have the house, you have the automobile, you have the resources, and they come into you after it, and they're not willing to do what it takes to get it, they just want you to give it to them, it's, it's very difficult to resist that. But you have to because they need to be healed. They don't need to be pushed on down the road with you financing their rebellion against God. So anybody that cares is going to struggle with that because we're, we, as Christians, we go the extra mile. So Jesus is not saying don't give up. I mean, don't, don't minister to them. He's just saying you're going to have to give some of these up to me and, and because he's the only one that can do anything with this. Now, I want you to bow your head with me for one, one moment, please. I know this is not a, like a salvation message or something like that. But I want you to hear, and I, I really want you to get this, if you will, please. I want you to, I want you to receive this because when I was working on this message, and I, I've been working on, on it more all week and, and been on it every day, and I've been praying, asking the Lord about it and what in the world would, 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 would we want to do uh, as an invitation to you? What would God want to say to you about this thing of rejection and about all the struggles that you've been through with people that you love and people that you feel responsible for and people that you're trying to do something in their life and God's called you to them and he's given you a message and, and, and you want them to hear it, but they just, they're just not listening and they're, and, they're, and they're still stealing and they're forging checks and they're in jail and, they're, and then you're believing and you're crying and you, you know, praying for them and you want them to be right and then you believe in them a little bit and then they get out and then they go right back to where they went and they got the same old nasty friends and got the same old problems that they've always had and it just seems like an emotional roller coaster you're on all up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down and the one that you blame most for that is yourself. I know it seems weird to think that, but you do. You, you, you take it in. You take it personal. And I, here's what I believe the Lord wants to say to you. And I hope you will receive this from the Lord. This is not your fault. I hope you will receive that from the Lord. Mom, Mom, this is not your fault. Dad, 
You weren't a bad dad. It's not your fault. Take yourself off the hook. Every pot has to sit on its own bottom, my grandmother used to say. And, and it's not your fault. Brother, it's not your fault. Sister, not, not your fault. I know that counseling and therapies and all those kind of things are available for lots of stuff. And even sometimes it takes medicine. And I know that. And I have respect for all of that. I, I, I know God has given all of us different gifts and abilities. And if we'll use them for him, he'll use them to help us. But sometimes you might not have seven years to go through counseling. And so you can ask God. Don't be afraid to ask God. God, can you pull up some of these bitter roots? I mean, can you, can, can you, can you dislodge some of this, uh, some of this uh, blindness here? Can you, can, you, can you work to open some eyes here that can see? Because I believe this is a bondage, and I believe that you could set them free. So I'm giving them up to you. It's almost like God is saying, do you trust me? I mean, do you trust, do you trust me? If you trust me, then give them up to me. I can do something. I can work in that life. I can give a point of view. I, I can change people in, a, in the twinkle of an eye. They can have a whole new sight of things if you give them up and let them go to him. Like the dad of the prodigal son, he just, he said, God bless my son in this silly time in his life. <laughs> yeah. And then he, did, then he got out of the way. And God brought his boy all the way back around. It might not have been comfortable for dad. Dad heard news that the boy was out at some bar somewhere, out at some joint, wasting all his money and riotous living. Dad just trusted God. Dad didn't go get him, didn't chase him down, didn't give him a lecture. Dad just, Dad knew that the boy was rebelling against him and it wasn't anything he's going to do about it. And he gave him to God and said, God, you do something. And God ran the boy all the way back around to the pig pen. At no point in his life did that younger son have to go to the pig pen. He could have turned around at any point along the way and said, you know, I'm going home. This is stupid. But he went all the way to the pig pen and dad let God take him there. We have to give it up to God. Rejection, horrible thing. 